Hi, this is Jeff Spence, your Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is my video lecture over Section 2.2. So this is about graphs and tables for quantitative data. We just, uh, in 2.1, went over graphs and tables for qualitative data. Remember, the difference between qualitative and quantitative is uh, qualitative is categorical, um, things that you can't do math mathematical arithmetic to, you can't add things that are categorical. And quantitative data is stuff that is, or uh, st data that, that you can do mathematical operations to. You can take averages of and add, and it makes sense. So, um, the objectives for this section are to construct and interpret a frequency distribution and relative frequency distribution for quantitative data. But we have different types, or we have different rules for discrete and continuous data. So, we've already done a frequency distribution and a relative frequency distribution in 2.1 for categorical or qualitative data, but we just have to be a little bit more careful with quantitative data, so we'll see that in the difference between discrete and continuous. Remember, discrete is countable and continuous is something that's measurable. Uh, we'll also, from those tables, uh, create histograms. We're going to skip a frequency, poly frequency polygon. After that, we can also look at construct and interpret stem and leaf displays and dot plots. And, um, and then we can look at the shapes of certain data once we create these graphs. The big, the, one of the most important things about creating these graphs in the first place is to determine the shape of this data set. So that's the last part. Frequency distributions and relative frequency distributions. We've done this before. This first example is a discrete data set of ages. Okay, So you can imagine maybe we go to a summer camp or what have you. Uh, a Halloween party or something with a bunch of children, and we record every uh, all the children's age. So as we go through, we realize that we have children age one to nine. We tally as we go through and come up with a frequency and thus a relative frequency for each age. This is exactly like the information that was presented in 2.1, where we were looking at um, doctors, lawyers, uh, athletes, the preferred career of certain college students. So basically each age, as you see it here, is like a category. Um, but the only difference is that the age as a number actually means something, okay? And we could look at average ages if we wanted to. So one thing you can do from this, though, from, from, these, uh, from this distribution is create classes. Now, classes are just intervals, all right? Let's just be clear on that. A class is just an interval, but that's the technical term in statistics. So, what this, uh, what this person who created this frequency distribution at the bottom decided to do was do classes from 1 to 3, 4 to 6, and 7 to 9. The way I determine a class width is simply just take the high number minus the low number, and I notice that these three classes all have a width of 2. Now, the key thing here, one rule that they're following is all the classes have equal width, and the other thing is is that there's no overlap. So that's really important. Like, for instance, 3 isn't listed twice, so we know exactly where the 1 to 3-year-olds go. They have 8 of them. 8 divided by 50 gives you the relative frequency of 0.16. So notice they just added the 3, the 3, and the 2 to get the 8. So classes sometimes can be helpful if our data values have a huge interval and we don't want to list each number individually. Imagine if I measured everybody's height to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. If we did that, you can imagine that almost everybody's height in the class would be different. We would have some 66.2s, some 79.1s, etc., 79.3s, and almost none of the heights would repeat. So doing a table like this wouldn't work very well because each each height would have a frequency of 1, and that wouldn't tell us much information about the data. So that's why we put things into classes and intervals, so that we can kind of summarize the data a little bit more quickly. Now, the book makes the construction of class limits very, very complicated, and there's really nothing wrong with what they're doing, but I really think we can boil it down and ignore these rules in the green to my three rules down at the bottom. Rule number one, classes must have equal width, okay? You can't have some classes that are a width of five and some classes that are a width of 10. It really cheats the representation of the data. So classes all have to have the equal width. Generally, you decide that pretty early on when you're constructing them. 
Second rule, classes must not overlap. So for instance, you can't have a class starting with 1 to 5 and then 5 to 9. That where What class would 5 go into if you listed 5 as the upper end for one and the lower end for the next one? So they must not overlap. And generally with the data set, you want to aim for 5 to 10 classes for your data. This is the most loose rule. Gener you know, I like, I think it gives you the best visual representation if you have about five to 10 classes. But if the data set is very large and you have a lot of numbers, you can definitely go over 10. But usually if you go below four, the data set, if you organize the data set in only about two or three classes, you're not getting a lot of information from that. So I generally say aim for five to 10 classes. So histograms are the graph that you create once you've created your frequency distribution and you've created your classes. So the first thing is, is that, remember, a histogram is just a bar graph, but instead of categories on the bottom, like doctor, lawyer, athlete, now we're going to have the classes, the intervals. So what the main thing you need to see here is, first, we're going to create the class limits and put those classes on the horizontal axis instead of the actual categories it'll be the intervals and then we determine the frequencies like we have from the table before and um, once we have those frequencies then we draw the rectangles vertically up to those frequencies so for instance here is a data set of test scores the way I create classes is I look at the data set and say okay I look at the lowest number which is 77 and the highest number which is 99 Neither one of those numbers is very good, a uh, very good number to start and end on. So what uh, the the PowerPoint did was they said, okay, why don't we just start at 75 and do a width of four, and then eventually we'll have about five classes that cover this whole data set. And that's exactly what they did. Okay, so notice they all have a width of four. They don't overlap, and um, they cover the whole data set. So once they created the classes, then all they did to create this table was, okay, I have a class of 75 to 79. I got to count all the test scores that are between that. So you can just go through, the, go through the test scores left to right and cross them off as you go. So for instance, 77 is the first one. That's the first tally. 79 is the second one. And 78 is the third one. So they tallied three. gives a frequency of three. To get a relative frequency, you take the frequency and divide by the total. And that's how they came up with this table. From that, we're going to create that table by hand and then put that in Excel, highlight it, and have them create a histogram for us. So notice, instead of categories on the bottom, you see intervals, frequency, or relative frequency. Either way, it shows you that, for instance, most people were scoring between 80 and 84, and the, uh, the least amount of people were scoring in the high 90s. So this is a good representation of where the scores were for this test. Remember, we don't want to list each individual score and put a bar for each individual score. We would have 20 different bars or about, a, about 20 different bars, and it wouldn't be very informative. Next is a stem and leaf. Now, for those students who have the book, the book does a great explanation on stem and leafs and does a more step-by-step -step approach of how this works. But for the sake of this, I'm going to do my best to explain this. Uh, they don't show the last step in this um, PowerPoint, however. Okay, so imagine we had 20 test scores again, and we're going to put them in what's called a stem and leaf. So the stem are the numbers on the left, and the leaf is the numbers on the right. Okay, and I'm going to go to the final product. The leaf, the numbers on the right here, are always, always the last digit of the data. So in this case, that's going to be the one spot. The, the stem, the values on the left, are the numbers to the left of the, of the leaf. So in other words, this is going to be the 10 spot. All right. If the 1 spot is going in the, in the leaf, then it must be the 10 spot in this case that is going in the stem. If you look at this, different, if you look at this data set, it ranges from 50 to 90 something. So what they did is they do a 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And what that 5 represents is the placeholder for all scores in the 50s, 6 is all scores in the 60s, and so on and so forth. From there, you take each individual data point and put them up. So this 5, 9 that you see right here is the score of 59. This 5, 1 is this score 51. 6, 0 oh, is this score of 60. And the benefit of a stem and leaf is that you get to see each individual data value. 
The problem with the stem and leaf though is if you have a ton of data values like 100 or more, creating one of these isn't going to be very useful or very easy to read. The last thing that they're forgetting to do and not showing in this uh, PowerPoint is that the leaf over here, these numbers must be in order. So they should have had the 1 first, the 5 1, and then the 5 9. The, there's a, many, many benefits to having numbers in order as we'll see later in chapter 3, but they didn't show that here. Last uh, picture or graph that we're going to look at is a dot plot. I hope you can understand and read this pretty easily. It's very much like a stem and leaf, but without the, the numbers. It's just a dot instead. We can see that we have one score at 88, one score at 98, and three scores at about 80. These are pretty easy to read. I won't have you uh, construct them, but you should be able to read them. They're also useful for comparing data sets from, say, two different classes, and you can compare those. You can see that this math class maybe scored, did a little bit better on the test than this one below. Lastly, we have distribution shapes, and I'm just going to put the three shapes up right away. Notice uh, each one of these is a histogram, okay? So imagine uh, the first histogram is heights, okay? And they divided up heights into... I don't know, it looks about inches here, everybody within certain inches classes. So they did the classes based on maybe about an inch. Notice that most of the data is in the middle and about the same amount of data tails off to the right as it does to the left. This was originally a histogram, but you can, if you can imagine drawing a curve through about the top of about every bar, it looks very bell-shaped, okay? And that's the shape that we're going to call this. There are many things that are symmetric, so I'm going to want you to avoid this. I, I want you to know that it's symmetric, but we're going to call it bell-shaped. There are many data sets in the real world that are bell-shaped. Tests, unlike the SAT, heights, weights, um, a lot of biological processes such as heights and weights generally follow a bell-shaped distribution, which means that most people score towards the average or have the, are close to the average height, and few people are well below or well above that average in the middle. The other two shapes are going to be right skewed and left skewed. Oops, I went past it. Right skewed and left skewed. Notice the tail running off here to the right. So this would be an example of maybe a lot of, a lot of the data actually here is on the left. The high frequencies are over here on the left. You can see that maybe this could be an example of students who scored poorly on a test. A lot of the students scored very low, while very few students scored very high. There's a lot of other examples of right skewed data, but we'll talk about that in class uh, later on. Left skewed is just the mirror image. Notice how most of the data is on the right and the tail runs off to the left. So most people are actually in the high range. This could be another, you know, a class that did very well on a test. Most people scored in the 80s and 90s, where few people scored very low. So those are the three shapes of data that we're going to work with in, in Intro to Stats. Uh, there are many other shapes. But these are the three that we're going to focus on for this class. So, in summary, I want you to remember uh, how to create classes. All right, They have to have equal width. They must not overlap, and you want to aim for 5 to 10 classes. They're just intervals of the numbers that you have. So that was the first example that they did here. Once we create the classes, you just tally up frequencies and come up with relative frequencies. And from there, we can come up with our histogram. After that... We're going to construct some stem and leaves. Generally, students do very well with this. The only thing they forgot to do was come up or put the put the leaf in order. We also, I want you to, to see dot plots, but we won't construct them. And then memorizing these three shapes and remembering, or sorry, memorizing the shapes and remembering some basic examples in the real world that we'll talk about in class are going to be very useful for us in the future as well.